This is Professor Ariel Ortiz Lagardere broadcasting from the International Bariatric Club Studios in San Diego, California. The theme of today's IBC Oxford University Hot Topics in Surgery exclusive event is The Battle of the Balloons and will feature experts from Kuwait, Qatar, the United States, the United Kingdom, Brazil, Armenia, Spain, Italy, and Germany. We would like to thank our partners Zoom Video Communications, YouTube, Facebook, and Bariatric News for setting up and promoting this event webinar, which is sponsored by our platinum sponsors, Medtronic, Ethicon, CMR Surgical, Lexington Medical, Panther Healthcare, our gold sponsors, Bariatric Solutions, Baxter, Advanced Medical Solutions, Peng Medical, our silver sponsors, MAS Bariatric Technologies, Richard Wolf, ConMed. This webinar is streaming to millions of viewers from over 200 countries and territories through the IBC website, ibcclub.org, the IBC YouTube channel, via Facebook Live to the IBC Facebook page, the IBC Twitter feed, LinkedIn, and via IBC Instagram. Today's event is organized by Mr. Harris Kwaja, consultant bariatric surgeon and director of IBC Global Education based at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, Imperial College London, and Christchurch, Oxford University. The event will be co-chaired by Professor Manuel Galvao Neto, director of IBC Innovations, and will be moderated by Dr. Helmuth Billy from the United States and Professor Eduardo Greco from Brazil. And now let me present our president and founder of IBC, to welcome all our viewers. Hi, Ariel. Hi, my dear friends. Good morning. Uh, Tuesday, that means another episode of uh, Hot Topics in Bariatrics uh, at IBC. Today, uh, we're talking about balloons. Uh, I know it's been confusing because there are so many options, which is good, but we would like to hear from experts, from those who are doing those balloons procedures every day, what they think, uh, which are good, which are not so good, or what there are indications, contraindications. Uh, so please stay tuned, ask questions and comments uh, at the end, as always, and enjoy today's program. Thank you, Tom, and welcome to all our viewers again. This is going to be one for the books. We are in the debate of the balloons, and the debaters are running with a fever today. So first of all, let's present uh, my co-chair and our, my, our dear good friend from IBC, Dr. Manuel Galvao. Manuel, welcome. Ariel, happy to be here. Thank you, wonderful. And our moderators, Eduardo Greco and of course, Helmuth Billy. Eduardo, como esta? Hola, Ariel, como esta? Muchas gracias por estar aquí, si? Sí. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Galvão, for always being kind of with me with this kind of thing. And thank you, Harris, of course, for being here. Thank you. And Helmuth, I know he's in the operating room, but maybe he's he's around. Yeah, I'm around. Here I am. All Sorry right. about that. <laughs> Sorry no about worries, that. Helmuth. You're, you're a hard worker. All right. Well, uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Eduardo Greco so he can present our first debate. Yes, of course. Let's introduce the first debate. It's going to be about the swallowable balloons we will place endoscopically placed in Tragaski balloons in the near future. We're going to have it, two experts on this this this, this time to, to talk about the balloons. So first, we're going to have a professor, Professor Salman Al-Sabah. That's come from Kuwait. Thank you very much for being here, Professor. Professor Salman is a bariatric surgeon. Uh, bariatric endoscopist, also chairman of surgery at Jaber Al Hamad in Hal Sabat Hospital at Kuwait, also president of the Kuwait Association of Surgeons, president of the Gulf Basic Surgery Society, and the associate professor of surgery at the Kuwait University. Thank you very much for being here. And again, we we'll talk also our my Brazilian friend Ana Carolina Hoff, that's director of the Angioscope Valley in Sao Paulo, and also bariatric surgeon and endoscopist bariatric. So thank you all of you for being here. And let's start first with Professor Salmon with your presentation. Please, you can share your screen, okay? Okay. 
First of all, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. And I'd like to thank Mr. Harris and Professor Manuel and the team from IBS for inviting me. This will be an interesting day. So uh, we'll be at, I'll be, uh, Mr. Harris gave me this topic to that uh, swallowable balloons will be replacing endoscopic place balloons. Uh, these are my disclosures. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. So in general, balloons have been used uh, for different indications uh, for weight loss. Uh, it depends where are you from. Uh, in the US, it's indicated between BMI 30 to 40. Many other countries, more than 27 BMI. Uh, some patients are reluctant to, to undergo surgery and others are not eligible for surgery. So the balloon is one bariatric option. Now, these are the balloons that have uh, been approved by either FDA or CE Mark in Europe. So I divided them. You can see here reshape, Apollo, Apollo 365, uh, or bear balloon, O balloon. O balloon is swallowable balloon and ellipse uh, and spots. And the rest of the balloons here are CE approved uh, balloons. So the, these are the uh, what balloons I have in, dealt with in, uh, in my practice. However, the, uh, today, for the reason of the debate, I will be focusing only on defending only the swallowable or the procedures balloon. If you're looking at procedures balloon, that means the ellipse balloon, which doesn't need any endoscopy, whether in insertion or removal. And I will be speaking on that behalf. So why swallowable balloons? And why I, the topic was given to me that swallowable balloons would replace uh, endoscopic place balloon. Uh, if we think about it, we think about it from four perspectives. First of all, from weight loss point of view, and then from safety, patient convenience, and cost. I'm going to hit on each of those uh, in more details. So uh, these are two major uh, studies that came up talking about uh, uh, the procedures balloon. Uh, more than a thousand patients in both. One of them is uh, multi-center. The other one is meta-analysis. And if we look at uh, these balloons in terms of uh, initial results. So uh, looking at swallowable balloons, initial results, you can see them, it's a very recent balloon uh, from 2017 data up to 2018 initially. And you can see that the total body weight loss is around 10%, from 10 to up to 15%. Uh, some of those uh, publications are from my center. My, in my practice, as I said earlier, I dealt with different balloons. And one of them is the swallowable balloon. If you compare it to uh, Dr. Daya Burham uh, from the US, uh, you can see that there is a meta-analysis. And if you look at the six month uh, endoscopic place balloon, it has uh, 6.7 total body weight loss. So in terms of weight loss, initial weight loss, if you compare the swallowable balloon to and to endoscopic place balloon, they're almost the same, if not better with a swallowable balloon. And if you look at maintenance, meaning that at one year after the balloon comes out, you can see this is again uh, data from uh, the swallowable balloons. Uh, we have here four studies. You're looking at that, uh, you can see the total body weight loss at 12 months, it ranges between 8% up to 13%. And if you compare it with the Abu Dhabi study, uh, which shows 11.3%. So even at one year, uh, the swallowable balloon. Uh, come very close to the endoscopic place balloon. Uh, also, these balloons, uh, you know, this is a new data not published yet. Uh, uh, you can always, with the swallowable balloons, you can always wait a month and take another balloon in, and that also en enhance the weight loss. So you can go beyond the period of time that the balloon stays. So the, the, this kind of balloon stays for four months, so you can do it twice. And with that, this study shows there's also a good weight loss with it. Now, so the second factor is when you look at balloons is safety. So uh, swallowable balloon, of course, it's procedureless, so they don't need endoscopy or anesthesia. So, and, and with that comes risk. That's why, you know, when, uh, when you do endoscopic place balloon, there's a risk of endoscopy itself and there's a risk of anesthesia. And uh, when it comes this to, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the anatomy and the risk of bleeding and ulcerations, uh, the swallowable balloon, it's very thin-walled balloon and it uh, uh, conforms to the anatomy, so it's very flexible. So that's why we don't see from our experience much uh, of bleeding or ulcerations compared to the uh, endoscopic place balloon. When you, we remove them, we can see you know, gastritis, ulcers, and so on. 
uh, it has better tolerance, uh, so less early removals of balloon. Uh, also, if especially those balloon, if placed on in uh, in young females, uh, with, you know, and then there is a chance that they get pregnant. Those balloon is safe because they don't need endoscopy and anesthesia for removal, which might cause abortion uh, during uh, even with the low risk. Uh, and then less uh, serious adverse event that I will speak about uh, here in this table. So this is from the two major studies with the with the swallowable balloon, you can see a multi-center and meta-analysis compared to a meta-analysis here with an endoscopy-based balloon. In terms of small bowel obstruction, so the main concern when we started having the swallowable balloons was what will happen if the balloon get cause a small bowel obstruction, if it migrates and cause small bowel obstruction. However, if you look at the multi-center study, the risk is 0.7% compared to 0.3% with the endoscopic-based balloon, uh, risk of small bowel obstruction. And in terms of early removal, you can see that it's 2.9%, 2.3% compared to 7.5%. So they have less risk of early removal. And the reason behind that is more tolerable. And I think that because of the shape of the balloon and the, and the, and the thickness of the wall. Perforation, it's much lower than the endoscopic plex balloon. And pancreatitis, similarly less uh, with the swell balloon. Again, I, because we think that the th theory behind pancreatitis is compression of the balloon on the pancreas. Those balloon, they have thinner wall and the more moldable, so, so the risk, risk is less according to these studies. I mean, these studies uh, we have experienced in this part of the world, multiple perforation that required laparotomies and laparoscopy too uh, because of endoscopic space balloon. Now, the other thing I want to focus on uh, really a disadvantage with uh, endoscopic place balloon that when you come to remove them, you have to keep the patient fasting sometimes up to two days of liquid diet, and that, you know, have some inconvenience to the patient. You have to buy a removal kit, and you have to put the patient under anesthesia. There is reports of mortality because of aspiration if you don't intubate the patient and do it safely. Sometimes the balloon gets stuck when you remove it into the esophagus and injure the esophagus. And uh, also, sometimes, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's very challenging that you need to do it in certain centers because you have to remove it under anesthesia. Whereas the swallowable balloon, you don't need all that. It's very convenient to the patient. Patient come to your office, you do it under x-ray, the patient goes home and it passes by itself through the rectum. Uh, if you look at it, this is from, from the industry, much bigger uh, number of 25,000 balloons. And if you, can, if you can see about intolerance, small bowel structure, even much more than what's published in terms of complications, similar with pancreatitis and gastric perforation. So it has really, really low uh, uh, in terms of adverse events. Uh, this is a, a video to show you that there is uh, uh, the difference between what happened during surgery. So uh, this is a, a small bowel obstruction due to the uh, swallowed balloon. And, and, and those two on the right side are due to uh, endoscopic placed balloon. The importance as a surgeon, when we do this, you see, we do small entrotomy. And then when you, when you divide the balloon to take the fluid, and this is for the first generation of those. You know, there is four more generation happened after this balloon before it was, uh, uh, you know, four uh, stitches. Now it has one complete stitch, so it's, it opens easier. So we don't see this kind of complication. But look at this, you know, you need to do a small entrotomy and then you remove the balloon easy without any problems. And then uh, you, you suture it, uh, you can see here, uh, with, uh, with uh, laparoscopically easily. If you compare this to, endoscopic place balloon, you can see it is very challenging to pull it. It's much thicker wall to divide. Uh, you can see you have to take your time to pull it with a lot of tension, as you can see here. And uh, with those kind of balloon, when small bowel obstruction happens, it's really, uh, it's more serious. And uh, sometimes uh, it's not easy to do and just close your suture. Sometimes you have uh, to, uh, to close this uh, defect with the stapler as you know, doing a, a, a new anastomosis. You can see here from the video, you can see we are doing anastomosis using a stapler because it's very close to the cecum. You cannot just suture and the, and the whole, the defects get big because the balloon is very hard to pull it out. And, and, and that's what happened when you have this kind of uh, obstruction. You can see we close it here and then we do the, the anastomosis. And, uh, 
and this at the end what we what, what we have and if you compare it to the different endoscopic place balloon again you can see in the lower video you have to do a bigger entrotomy to be able to remove it you have to put a lot of torque to take it out compared to the swallowable balloon and then even when you close it you, it's a bigger defect to close takes more time more you can see you can, much bigger defect when you remove it so again, when even a small bowel obstruction could happen with swallowed balloon, much less from according to the data I showed you to the endoscopic place balloon, and not even and even if that happened, uh, you're gonna have a smaller hole, easier surgery to be done compared to the endoscopic place balloon. So the last thing I want to speak about is cost. You know, by eliminating the cost associated with two endoscopy, because when you do endoscopic place balloon, you do two endoscopy, one for insertion and one for removal, and that it means. Uh, uh, more cost and more inconvenient to the patient to come twice to the hospital. And also, uh, uh, you can use those kind of costs to, you know, support the patient for in terms of weight loss. And, you know, this kind of, especially as well, balloon, we use technology with those kind of balloon to monitor their weight loss. And that helps a lot even to have more weight loss because using kind of a telehealth, uh, and especially with, with the crisis right now with Corona. I mean, this kind of balloon, because they don't require anesthesia, and we know the risk of anesthesia with corona, and to, it decreases the morbidity of the procedure. So it did really well in, in this kind of crisis. And also, in terms of cost, it's really important. So to summarize, uh, procedures with swallowable balloons are efficient for weight loss. I showed you the data, safer according to the data again, more convenient for the patients, and more tolerable. Uh, patient comes once to the, your office, you can monitor him through uh, telehealth using uh, technology and even less costly. So with these factors, I think swallowable balloons uh, will replace uh, endoscopic based balloons. But keep in mind, you have to have all these tools. I honestly do both kind of balloons. Uh, each balloon has advantages, but for the reason of this lecture, these are the important points that why procedures swallow balloon will replace endoscopic balloons. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Salman. That's a really good presentation. Thank you very much. You're very, very, really clear. And now I would like, we are receiving some uh, questions from the YouTube, from the audience, more than 3,000 people watching this presentation. And now I will introduce Senna Carolina Hoff for the next presentation. After that, we're going to do the, the questions, OK? Please, Anna. Yes, just share your screen, please. Can you see it? Yes. Now, yes, yeah. that's perfect. Just put them full. Yes. Perfect. Hello, my dear colleagues. I'm here today to tell a story, a story that involves security. And let me emphasize this word security, changing the way we play a match. And let me say we play a hell of a good match and to expose to social media, which is very important today because today lawsuits are amplified due to social media and mistakes can cause you to move to Iceland, at least. Presenting to you all the available data is just a formality. We've been placing balloons for two decades and we have authority enough to pinpoint weaknesses of our new methods. New doesn't mean good or safe. I'd like really to focus on our Brazilian consensus which shows a series of 40,000 cases performed by 39 of our most skilled Brazilian uh, endoscopists. And it's over here. I'm not going to emphasize weight loss and compare tables like Dr. Salman. We know the biggest weight loss occurs on the first months of the treatment. There's no doubt of it. I'm not going to emphasize complications either Traditional balloons have also their complication, their obstruction issues due to migration. Only here in Brazil, we have methylene blue in order to minimize potential leaks and to act before the mass takes place. Patient's urine turns blue and we have time to act and change the tire, let me put it this way. And uh, 
We also have removals due to intolerance, which is an issue to liquid filled balloons. Those numbers are pretty much the same uh, when it comes to ellipse, not obalon. Uh, we may not see this very often with gas filled balloons such as obalon, but the weight loss kind of matches the ones achieved by use a GLP-1 analog such as laraglutide or semaglutide, like Dr. Ring do the show later on. It's her, it's her the indication. Contraindication, the number represents our concerns, absolute and relative contraindication to balloon implants. Images are so much better than words, aren't they? Here are some of my candidates to balloon implants during the two last years. Look at them, large hernias that look like a megaesophagus due to a previous gastric band that ended up performing an ESG, as you can see on the right. Esophageal varices, some more. Eosinophilic esophagus, grade C and D esophagitis, and a horrible double time liar, previous valve surgery, and did not obey the 12 hour fasting order. Acute gastric ulcers and chronic gastric ulcers, the chronic gastric turned to be a gastric cancer. So we can talk security. We might as well shout out this word, not only talk. And the world here, surgeons seek better lenses, endoscopy dreams about enhanced view endoscopes, 3D tech. Are you willing to go blind to play Russian roulette? I, I don't, I, I don't. We live in a vast planet with different realities, but let me say it once again, again, safety is everything. It's all about human lives. When you guys show me a huge pew tied to a string where 40% of the patients are unable to swallow without help, I think about how many sips of water are necessary and the urge to vomit may and can lead to bronchoaspiration too. Price is a big issue too when we talk to upper endoscopy here in Brazil. Elsewhere, but not here in Brazil, it's such the opposite. Why the urge to perform an endoscopy before balloon placements? I've shown the pictures before. Because direct view is the gold standard. Try to convince the surgeon to insert the portals and then to do it without turning the camera on. He may have an x-ray, OK? By 2020, we can have an x-ray rather than a clear, direct view. It's nonsense. I'm sorry. Uh, also, during treatment, almost half of the patients will need an endoscopy anyway. Maybe they are experiencing some pain, may have they are experiencing some discomfort, and, and you are going to feel safer taking a glimpse at their GI tract, is what I'm doing here. Some of them, of them are not losing weight and double and doubt if the balloon is there. Yesterday, my first procedure yesterday was all about that. And obviously, adjustable balloons need adjustment. We are in a country where an upper endoscopy costs $50, two Walgreens Caesar salads. It's sad but true. I googled the other data, but I'll be happy to hear from you guys endoscopy pricing around the world. Um, here in Brazil, of course, endoscopy is available in every endoscopic center, of course. Propofol is a blessing. It makes the procedure safe, quick, and patients stay still as a corpse. Like I said before, we do place a lot of adjustable balloons because of those who accept a second endoscopic, endoscopic early removal numbers due to intolerance are close to zero. So it's very important to keep it in mind. Another point is radiation. We undergo mammographies and CTs and x-ray due to dental treatments. Mouth scanning is still to a few that can afford it. Talking to my husband, who is also a surgeon, and to my dearest colleagues and friends, uh, we came up, we raised some uh, other issues. There are points here that I've, I've pointed here. We could go on and on and for hours, but let's do it some other day when we can meet in person and have some talisker along. In a country where a great parcel of us work in endoscopic clinics, we don't have x-ray. 
we don't have x-ray av availability. Going to an x-ray clinic makes me lose money, and I do, and I do need time and to do everything else rather than being a doctor. Uh, let's see the other one. Two of our publications, the 12 month period is more favorable than it when we discuss weight loss. Time is everything when you need to change habits and obesity, treating obesity is all about buying time to patients to change their minds. The second publication emphasizes that even though 71% of the total body weight loss occurs on the first six months of the treatment, 20 more 9% uh, happens on the last semester. It almost one third of the final result. I don't want to be boring, but those four months offered by Ellipse or those six months offered by Obalon are still too little. You guys outside Brazil need a one year treatment to come up with consistent results. And I'm not talking about spots three here, only or placing a second balloon in sequence. I'm talking about Corpore and Apollo 365, we don't have it here. And why not developing a more lasting swallowable balloon as long as we have the chance of knowing our patients' insights before placements. This is the point where I could compare weight loss tables, but I won't, I won't waste your time on that. It would be another win for my team. I don't want to screw the swallowable method, but I just want you to make you, us think, what about we, we can be done to make it safer because blindness is not safety at all. And one of my friends reminded me that some rare cases that are very, really rare when you work at a high clinic volume, when you have a leakage spotted right after you disconnect the catheter, another thing that can point to the importance of direct viewing. And I'm, not, I'm a super open-minded, but I still have a low number of cases around the world and there are very few services working with swallowable balloons. So we have to wait a bit more. Once it becomes more popular, true results will appear, but for it to happen, costs have to be lower. We can offer a four month treatment for $4,000. And in my point of view, I'll go with a hybrid method placing it under direct view and letting nature do its job, okay. Or at least having a wristing endoscopy of the patient to avoid nasty surprises. Let me thank my friends. Some of them are brothers to me, Jimmy, Sergio, Helmut, Diogo, Artalis, and Galvão. We are a true team. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much for this really, really good presentation. So right now, to, are we going to make some questions? Ariel, do you want to make some questions or I can start doing this? Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, asking. Uh, yes, definitely. So let's start off by asking both. And I'm going to start off with Anna. It would seem that she is advocating that the placement method is, a, is an advantage uh, as pre-visualization of the gastric lumen before placing a balloon. So having said that, I'd like to see if you can actually support that with uh, uh, literature. So I, I would uh, like to ask her first and then have Salman uh, rebuttal. Uh, of course, yes, but I haven't prepared this because uh, the, the, the literature is very vast and I, I had so little time to, to talk about uh, our traditional balloons that I know you guys have it a lot, and I promise I'll, I'll keep a link, I'll put a link on your IBC channel uh, of those literature so we can uh, emphasize the, those findings. And just to be clear, all of you over there are endoscopists and you might have seen a lot during those two decades contrary indications of those balloons and what could be could have happened if we place those balloons. Uh, we, we have a private group here in Brazil called BEB, and uh, we know about a lot of things that happens when the patient don't tell us the truth and everything else. So I stick with the direct view. I love looking at the, the patient inside and knowing my, my way. 
Professor Salman. Yeah. So in terms of uh, visualization, I agree. You know, we we like to visualize and make sure you know the patient doesn't have, have any pathology or abnormality. Having said that, you know we take really good history with the patient, and seventy percent you know of the time history is good enough. Yeah. But also we do, when we replace the balloon, we, we don't fill the balloon without doing an X-ray. So we make sure the balloon in the right spot and, and then we inflate. So there's less chances of having any uh, issues. And we, there's 25,000 plus cases done worldwide. And uh, there was no you know, any major problem due to insertion of the balloon. And again, uh, even if let's say, if we put the balloon and the patient could not tolerate it for whatever pathology there is, he can remove it much easier endoscopically compared to the uh, endoscopic place balloon because it has very thin wall. You take it out, and especially with the new balloons, the one-year balloons, okay? Uh, it's much thicker. If, uh, if, if you do earlier, uh, if the patient got intolerable from the beginning of the first three weeks and you try to remove it, it's not easy because it's very thick and it, you have some tears in the esophagus and so on. So what I'm trying to say is that we, I'm a surgeon as well, and I agree that we have to you know, visualize, but having history, x-ray, and placing the balloon, a very thin balloon inside, so far it's been safe. And I'm sure there's different methods we can do if there is any suspicion with the history. Of course, you can do endoscopy or even you know, scope through the nose. You know, the nasal scope is very small scope. We can do it in the clinic. You don't need to go to the endoscopy suite. So I think the future, uh, I'm sure there will be even more progress but with the 25,000 cases, multiple publications so showing its safety with a benchmark less than 2%, uh, uh, that's what's uh, agreed by the FDA, I think uh, it's, it's safe. Professor Salman, thank you very much for sharing your big and great experience. And uh, the people from the audience that's asking about this thing, about the endoscopy before doing or not doing this, and I would like to know also in your real practice about how you manage with the patient with the swallowable balloon. You, you, you told us, and of course, we think the same. We got a new method. We're going to use it endoscopically balloons, intragastic real, uh, normal balloons. We're going to use the swallowable balloons. We think that we can have this kind of things for different kind of patient. And what do you think in your real practice indications, different indications from balloons? Maybe teenagers, you can use the swallowable balloon for teenagers to not provide the endoscopy. I would like to know a little bit more the indications of this kind of balloon, please. Yeah, this is an excellent question. Again, all these are tools. We go from, you know, from uh, endoscopy up to surgery. And even with endoscopy, now we have multiple tools. And it depends on the patient factors and discussion with the patient. And as you said, one of them, young uh, female, uh, younger age, you know, higher, and especially if you are in an area there's high fertility, like where I'm in, you know, so you have to make sure that all these factors come into, uh, we are more into personalized medicine nowadays. So we have to think more about the patient as a holistic and make sure all these two, we know we have all these tools and we use the best for them according to their condition itself. So as you said, if there is, you know, someone who, who is, let's say, uh, uh, older, then maybe better to do endoscopy and maybe place, since you're doing the endoscopy, place the endoscopic balloon. But if you are, uh, you know, younger uh, population and fertile and uh, there's no history and you're happy with the patient and the x-ray is fine, one, so you place the balloon, uh, the swallowed balloon. Okay. So all these are tools for us. Uh, the more they, they get advanced, the more knowledge we have, the better we're going to have uh, for our patient in terms of consent. Okay. And for Ario, I'm going to change to Anna. And Anna, I agree with you. It's really, really important, the safety of the procedure, the safety of the patient. But uh, this is a new method. The swallowable balloon is going to start in a few, in, uh, yes, in few days, few months. It's going to arrive in Brazil and it's going to be a, a real thing for us. And the... Uh, in the past three, four years, we have this, some kind of discussion with the surgeons about the Apollo. They tell, no, it's not usable because, and now you're going to have this kind of thing, this kind of debate in the endoscopies. We are endoscopies, and uh, do you think that we're going to not use the swallowable balloon because you are endoscopies, we, or we have to be prepared, prepare ourselves, prepare our offices to make it happen? Please. 
we have to, to prepare our office to make it happen. So I think it must be on the menu, of course, but we have to think about uh, lawsuits and we have to think about social media that can ruin our lives if we have uh, a kind of problem. You know that in Brazil, social media is everything. And you can be either on the top or in the top bottom and moving to Acre in order to, to cover your mistakes. So I do think I'll, I'll go with the hybrid thing. I'll do my upper endoscopy before and then the, 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 the patient is free to, to swallow the balloon and I'm, I'm free to, to put my pillow, my, my head in the pillow, knowing that there are no varices because they, they won't appear on the x-ray. There are no ulcers because they won't appear on the x-ray. It not, it's not, not just a matter of positioning the balloon. Because I, want, I want to stay with a clear conscience and I don't want any lawsuits. And that's, that's pretty much it. Yes, I agree. Ariel, please. Okay, and uh, yes, I, I appreciate both both views. Extremely important because, like we said, there's new devices out there, and there's always advantages. Like uh, Salman was presenting uh, specifically on the uh, swallowable balloon, and Anna mentioned that uh, especially during the first month is where we see most of the weight loss. So one question that I want to pose to both of you: Is it really an advantage to having? Knowing that the balloon, the, the major objective of having a balloon is weight loss. Is there an advantage to having in the swallowable balloon category the titrate, titrate ability? In other words, you have adjustable balloons where you have to go in and go out and adjust them. Or basically with these balloons, you just swallow another balloon and you're actually adjusting that uh, gastric lumen for the new a uh, phase of that uh, treatment. I'd like to hear some comments on that. Please do, Professor Salmon. Professor Salmon, please. Sure, thank you. Uh, so uh, this is an excellent question. So in terms of how long, you know, most of the studies, as Dr. Anna showed, that uh, what the weight loss mostly happened the first four months, let's say, and then it will maintain. Uh, so most of this one-year balloon or adjustable balloons, it will help to maintain the weight more than dropping down the, the weight. And the issue that the, the stomach gets used to the balloon if you keep it for longer time, and then you can, you, we see the weight regain happens and, and the complication with it. Uh, now, uh, that's the good thing about those swallowable balloons, they, are, they, they model the stomach. They are very thin, so they, can, they shape with the stomach, sh uh, stomach size. Uh, compared to the other balloons you, that you might, you know, you have a range between 400 to 700 and you have to make sure, you know, this will not be a big balloon according to the stomach and it's difficult to adjust. So uh, this is one advantage. Now, I agree with you if you think about having balloon after balloon, but again, the, the stomach is very smart and it gets used to things. This is my personal opinion. It's not uh, scientific uh, supported, but I think if you give a gap between so the, the stomach comes back to its uh, normal size and then put another balloon, it's much easier. Now, uh, we see, may, for example, my personal experience, you know, the adjustable balloon, it gives more weight loss, but on the expense of symptoms and tolerability and difficulty to, uh, in removal. And, you know, I showed you videos when if something bad happens, like migration, then it's, even the surgery will be difficult. So all these, you have to balance, I think, out all these factors and according to the patient factors as well, and, uh, and choose what you think is, is the best to the patient. Okay. So Anna, do you wanna make some comments? Oh, I, I, I think, think adjustments are just good for downward adjustments because they, they, might mitigate the, the early removal thing, you know, as well as, as, I, as I know, that when you reduce the volume of a balloon, the chances of, of having an early intolerance and removal is close to zero. So this is, we have literature on that too. And I think about going up uh, and spots, and we have this very, very new, study that Fittipaldi posted yeah. on our group week. Uh, we, we, we had this conclusion before, but not the, uh, in a double blinded randomized 
control group uh, that the upward adjustment isn't that good. So I do it with air, uh, along with Professor Manuel Galvão, who, who, who did it with me. And it's a, it shows a great, a great thing to, to do a hybrid balloon. So we use both fluid and air, so it gets bigger without having the volume uh, and the and principally and, and, and mainly the the the, the weight uh, for the gastric chamber and the incisura angularis that leads to to the those ulcers uh, due to the tail. Yes, and another thing is that I I choose to go on uh, combined therapies nowadays because in the middle of the treatment, most of the patients are going to, to lack GLP-1 or oxytomodulin or PIY, and we are going to deal with the fact that we have to combine therapies to have a good uh, outcome. And when we remove the balloon, you can still maintain the weight loss or maintain the weight with the GLP-1 analog or another medication. So nowadays I'm, I'm fully, open-minded to that. Okay, Anna, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Professor Salman, thank you very much for your presentation, for your time. Now I, I come to Aria, my dear friend, to continue with the next debate. Thank you, thank you all. Aria. Ariel, you, you must my mute it. We are not hearing you, my friend. All right, wonderful. So thank you so much. Uh, great uh, debate, Eduardo. Uh, and uh, I want to pass it on now to Helmuth Billy. So let's see if he's uh, online. He, I knew he was surgery yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah. I'm here, Ariel. Thank you very much. We thank step you, back. Can you, all, can you all hear me and see me in my glorious outfit? Yes, sir. I dressed for today. So. <laughs> Okay, so it's, it really gives me great pleasure to be able to uh, introduce uh, our next uh, speakers. Uh, Mohammed Rizwan, it's very uh, uncommon that you get to actually introduce uh, somebody who was your own fellow for a while. Mohammed is a uh, consultant surgeon, and he works at, uh, at uh, Hamad Medical Center in Doha, Qatar. He's the expert on... Uh, on balloon placement, and he has a wide uh, variety of experience with all of the balloons that uh, that our friend Salman introduced us to. And he will be debating against another world expert, which is Reem. We all know Reem very well. She's ex uh, experienced. She's an associate professor of medicine at Weill Medical College of Cornell, who also has a, a campus in Do Doha. Uh, she's Director of Interventional and Therapeutic Endoscopy, as well as the Director of Bariatric and Metabolic Endoscopy. She's clearly an expert in advanced endoscopic procedures and uh, for non-surgical treatment of weight loss as well. Um, I'm looking forward to their debate, and uh, we're going to start it off with, uh, with Mohammed. And uh, here they go. Welcome, Mohammed. Welcome, Reem. Thank you, Dr. Willie. Uh, this is Dr. Islam. Uh, thank you for the lovely introduction and uh, to begin with, uh, good evening, good morning to everyone. First of all, let me quickly uh, thank the panel here, especially Harris, for taking the effort to organize the debate and for giving us the opportunity to participate in such a debate to share uh, my positive experience over the airfield balloon and in Qatar. Um, I would share my screen for my PowerPoint presentation. I think everybody can see it clearly. Yes. Yeah, all right. Uh, basically, I don't have any disclosures. And what I would be talking about is uh, mainly about uh, the balloon called as Heliosphere. This is the hospital, the Harvard Medical Corporation, where most of the bariatric surgeries, invasives, and non invasive surgeries go on. Dr. So Billy is much aware because he frequently visits us over here. Uh, so this balloon is actually uh, an airfield balloon called as an hemisphere uh, new tech balloon. Uh, they have labeled it as new tech probably because it advanced from generation to generation 
and the generation that I had been using from 2014 is uh, the new tech generation, which actually had a bigger valve compared to the latest version, which ended up having a tiny valve, probably to make the extraction much easier. Uh, going back to the first generation and second generation, as I know, the first generation was somewhere in 2004 and lasted till 2009, uh, which was called as an heliosphere bag. Uh, with the same volume of 600 ml. And thereafter, from 2009 to 2012, they had the second generation uh, of balloon with a gold plate, uh, a gold lining all over the balloon. I don't know why it was gold plate, maybe for patients to feel more privileged to have such a balloon in the stomach, though I, I, I didn't follow that generation. I started to have uh, the third generation of balloon, which was called as the, the new tech uh, balloon. So starting with the uh, <coughs> presentation, Hellistria Neotech, uh, it's an intragastric balloon for six months for treatment of obesity. It's basically made from uh, polyurethane and silicon. Probably this character of the balloon makes it more softer and smoother. It's filled with almost 100% uh, of air. Um, it weighs about 12 grams with a volume of uh, 600 ml. Talking about the efficacy, uh, we have data already presented from various uh, fellow surgeons and gastroenterologists on about 1,800 year balloons globally. If we start in an ascending order, year-wise, uh, from lower bottom of the slide going up, if we see 2009 uh, in, from Italy, uh, Giovanelli has presented almost 530 uh, cases of uh, heliosphere balloon where he had a weight loss uh, in kilograms extending from 12.2 uh, in low BMI patients, say less than 35, and higher BMI patients more than 50, ranging to 15.9 uh, weight loss, which is quite good. Going up towards 2016, if we say Italy uh, with Palmisano also has uh, almost a similar weight loss in kilograms of about 10.1. And going on the top, which is a very recent publication of 2020, uh, from France, we have Romney, who also has a weight loss of almost 12.2 uh, kilograms. So ideally, if we say these kind of air-filled balloons, uh, they, they give us a weight loss ranging from almost 10 to 14 kilograms as per the various studies uh, published in this series. Very recently, there was an abstract presentation by Gaulish, uh, and this is in 2020, uh, the, with, a, with a topic that talks about endoscopic intragastric balloon, a gimmick or a viable option for obesity. So, uh, uh, Gaulish actually gave a very quick comparison with all the kinds of existing balloons globally. So, on the left hand side of the slide, if you see, we have ellipse balloons, uh, heliosphere bag, Lex Bell, Metzel, O balloon, Urbera, Reshape, Spads. I think uh, Dr. Salman also talk, he spoke about all these balloons. Uh, almost all of them are CE marked, uh, with the uh, Orbera, O balloon, and Reshape having the FDA approval. And Heliosphere falls somewhere third in number. Uh, I think it's alphabetical or we mentioned. So, this data was actually published about Heliosphere in the year 2009. Probably this was the first generation of balloon, and that's why it was labeled as Heliosphere bag. Uh, this air balloon had a total body weight loss of 13.4%. Uh, when compared to other uh, balloons. So uh, I think by FDA, it has been clearly approved that any balloons that uh, these devices where they lose 5% and above of total body weight loss, uh, this is an accepted weight loss uh, estimatedly and an excess weight loss of about 25% and more also makes the device, uh, device as a, a good positive responder uh, weight loss category. So if we compare Hedgesphere now with uh, liquid filled balloons towards the end of my slide, say Orbera and Reshape. Reshape actually takes the highest volume of 900 ml and it got uh, a total body weight loss of 6.8%, which is far beyond uh, the air filled balloon. And similarly, if we talk about Orbera, it has about 10.2% uh, of total body weight loss. And if you go on the top of my slide, Ellipse it has almost 10% of total body weight loss. So if we speak about the air filled balloon, which is heliosphere, in comparison with other balloons, they're almost in the same line, whether it's air filled or whether it's, it's liquid based. So, I have some experience of, of this heliosphere in my hospital in Hamburg Medical Corporation uh, with 245 
uh, patients in which the um, in which I had females with about uh, 183 uh, uh, females and about uh, 63 of them were males. So, you know, in, in Middle East, we have a huge uh, issue about females uh, having more obesity here than the males. Actually, we have almost 60% of our males obese, and this makes sense that why we have a lot of balloon insertion in females when compared to the males. So if you see the graph, the age groups where I put these balloons range from almost uh, 14 years of age from teens ranging to 60 years of age, and BMI range was almost 27 to 50, with an excess weight ranging up to 75 kilograms. Going above, if we see um, <clears throat> the mean uh, total weight loss in person, so we achieved almost 8.2 percent of total weight loss. And if we talk in weight uh, in kilograms, almost like eight kilograms, and excess weight loss is about. 32%. So uh, we are almost there compared to the other studies uh, where we saw the weight loss of about 10 to 12 uh, kilograms when we go for air filled versus uh, liquid filled balloons. Uh, so, uh, this slide also talks about the weight loss, which I just mentioned about, where in kilograms the weight loss, the mean weight loss was almost like 8 kilograms, and total weight loss also was 8.3, whereas excess weight loss was uh, ranging up to 32%. In this slide, I, I tried to split uh, females versus males. As I mentioned earlier in genders, we had 163 females, and it was double the amount of the males uh, which I had done. I and mean, if you talk about the weight loss, we see for some reason males losing much more than the females. And if, even if you compare the total body weight loss, we have uh, males losing much more than females. Probably the reason that I could explain for this is the kind of lifestyle or sedentary lifestyle with the females that we have. We prefer mainly to be at home, and most of uh, the culture here, we are sweet lovers. So everybody likes loves to eat sweets, and less of movement due to the weather condition in this part of the world. And these all matters exactly if, if we go into the history of the patient to, to see what was the reason they didn't lose much. So the sedentary life actually pushes us, you know, the kind of patients here not to lose much. If we talk about the, uh, the length of heliosphere balloon, in both of these categories of patients, if you see on the left hand side of uh, the, the slide, we see uh, most of the females, they got the balloon removed somewhere at six months, but we have some patients getting the balloons removed earlier. So probably this was due to the intolerance and uh, in females that pushed us to remove the balloons. Again, the culture here, uh, the kind of patients here don't want to suffer with them, despite they have been explained previously that any balloons, whatever are done, irrespective of air or liquid, uh, there has to be, they will have some kind of nausea, vomiting, and some sort of abdominal pain at the beginning, at least lasting for a week. But the, the population here doesn't really accept this, especially females where they are shown more sympathy by, by their relatives, their parents, or you can say their children, where they insist on early removals. And that's why we have, I mean, significant intolerance in the beginning, especially with females. Whereas we go to males, uh, most of them, again, got the balloons removed around six months and beyond six months. And we have even patients getting, uh, keeping the balloon in for 10 months. Probably most of them, when they were asked why they didn't, they didn't come for uh, a timely removal, they explained us saying that we felt if we keep the balloon longer, we might lose more. And some of them here even traveled abroad. Most of them uh, prefer traveling abroad for uh, higher education and for training facilities abroad. And they hesitate to remove it outside, and when they arrive to us, they're already moved. The balloon has already migrated, and basically, we don't even see them on x -ray. Again, this is a comparison between adults to teens, which is very interesting. We had almost 224 adults versus 21 teens. Uh, teens, in, uh, I mean, from age group of 14 to 18. And if we see, it's very clear here, the weight loss is much significant in, in, in teens when compared to adults. Again, the cause could be the, the, the teens are more active uh, in, in, in attending schools and the diet control in them is much more than in adults. And also the BMI could be a factor. If you see the BMI of the teens are, are much more higher than compared to the adults. And we all know that higher the BMI, the better the weight loss. When it comes in terms of uh, the length of heliosphere in adults versus in teens, in teens were more, more punctual at the moles. Most of them got removed at 5.5 to 6 months, whereas in adults, as we explained, uh, we had some early removals due to intolerance and some late removals 
uh, from some patients not being in the country. And the most important slide, as a surgeon, we all are scared with balloons uh, about the adverse effects. So this is particularly the, the similar slide we had earlier, uh, which is some advanced data about intolerance from the previous studies. And we see from 2006 going up to 2020, the, the intolerance level is almost uh, in between 1.5% to 4%, so highest being 4%. And pancreatitis and erosion basically were not seen in any of these studies. We just had in Tunisia in 2014, where we had two ulcers. And we have talked about migration and almost all the studies, none of them spoke about surgical removals. And the maximum migration percentage we see is ranging from 1.3 to 1.6%. And this is my experience, personal experience uh, in Hamza Ayatul Corporation with all, all 245 patients, what I had. What we see here is the males, they were more tolerant uh, to these balloons compared to uh, the females. The females, as I mentioned, they were, for some reason, insisting on early removals. Probably most of them even got pregnant, like Dr. Salman was mentioning. So we had several reasons to get them removed. But I mean, none, none were a serious or, or serious adverse effects for which the balloons were removed. And then talking about the uh, spontaneous uh, deflation, meaning these are those category of patients where we found the balloons when we went in on the six months were already deflated for some reason. And we found in males, this, uh, this percentage of deflation was much higher compared to females. Probably the reason could be that um, <clears throat> males are, are, are smokers or the kind of diet they eat. And in this part of the world, we know many of them love this uh, hubbly wubbly or shisha, what they call us, could be other reason uh, for these balloons, you know, to, to deflate. Or I, I, won't, I won't go behind talking about technical issues with the balloons. So probably that's the reason the company even changed the valve from a bigger valve to a smaller one. And if we talk about the migration, again, the males had much more migration than the females. Probably the issue was most of them travel abroad and they come late back and they end up, ended up with having migrations. And if you talk about pancreatitis, we had none. Ulcers and gastric erosions in these aircraft buildings were none. Stomach and bowel perforation was almost zero, and bowel obstruction was also nil. The similar data comparing, uh, comparing adults to teens, if you see teens had none of the adverse side effects. Neither of them had any migrations, no spontaneous deflations, and no intolerance. Probably again, it's because of their lifestyle, the kind of food, and uh, kids, of course, no smoking habits here. That's why none of them got any adverse side effects. Just to summarize the presentation, most of the patients, they completed uh, this airfield balloon uh, with six months therapy and were satisfied. Side effects were mild and transient, which we all know the first week, all of them suffer with any kind of balloon. And its lightness allows a low pressure on the stomach wall. And that's why none of them had ulcers and they had no pancreatitis in fact. Uh, heliosphere insertion, basically, it's a fast procedure. It's easy to place, takes less than five minutes under GA. And it's very safe to remove. Of course, it's, it's surgeon driven, more skills, more experience, and, and there, there is a learning curve, of course, for any procedures. Intolerance levels in this series was basically due to the cultural aspects of females here, where they insisted, or it was a personal opinion of the female to get it removed, and that's why we had a good number of intolerance levels. Efficacy, if we talk about heliosphere, was almost in line with any liquid filled balloons, losing almost like 8 to 10 kilograms of weight, and we didn't have any serious uh, adverse effects. Basically, heliosphere migrates smoothly through the gut if removal is delayed without ball obstruction. What I realized from my personal experience uh, with these deflated balloons during six months, all these balloons, those were deflated, were completely deflated. There was no air found in the balloon, so I don't, I, I didn't have any necessity to trick the balloon to deflate. I just had to grasp it and pull it out. And all of them took the shape of a sausage, or you can say a cylindrical shape. Probably this could be the reason why these balloons migrated spontaneously without causing any obstruction. Um, and we know that uh, the higher BMI, we have a better weight loss, like in most of the studies and even my study here. And better weight loss in my study was seen in males and of course in teens. And intensive lifestyle intervention, of course, with hemisphere can give a modest weight loss, I think, with any other balloons in the same thing. Uh, uh, and we know that, uh, <clears throat> You know, the extent of uh, balloon that stays in the stomach. If, uh, some people or patients or even surgeons have a feel that longer the balloon stays, the better the weight loss. I, I don't think this is the scenario. As the discussion today, most of the weight loss is seen initially in, in three to four months uh, of the stay of balloon in the stomach. 
So there's no idea of keeping balloons for a longer period of time and end up having more problems. So it's ideal to have a balloon that stays for six months in the stomach, go in by a scope, see the balloon, see the stomach, pull the balloon out. If the patient wants, you can have a second balloon inserted to have uh, another six months of completion of the balloon therapy. Regaining weight after balloon and for the, after any bariatric surgery, it's always a concern. So these are just the references um, that I wanted to go to. Thank you uh, for all your attention. I think I will get back with Dr. Billy, handing him over. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rizwan. Outstanding presentation. And uh, very unusual to have such a breadth of experience as you uh, have collected over the years. It's actually rather valuable to all of us who have a lower volume of, of cases than you do on a monthly basis. I'm going to turn it over now to Reem, who uh, is probably someone that I would not want to debate because she has an international reputation uh, from the United States, from Weill Cornell. And uh, she's going to talk about air-filled balloons. We'll uh, replace fluid-filled balloons in the near future with her counterpoint. Okay, Reem, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. So uh, my task today is to, um, is to talk about the counterpoint, as Dr. Helmuth Beltley said. So essentially, I will try and prove to you that air-filled balloons will not replace fluid-filled balloons for the following reasons. So these are my disclosures. And uh, just simply put, air and water don't mix. Water is heavier than water. And why is that important? Just remember basic physics and why, how and balloons work. So when we look at the obesity landscape, all of us know this, a lot of people are affected with obesity. And because of this, we have access to many options. We have medications, we have lifestyle, and we have surgery. We're talking here about balloons and simply fluid-filled balloons and why they're much better than air-filled balloons. Remember uh, what we want to achieve with endoscopy. We want to achieve at least 10% total body weight loss because this will help improve comorbidities. It's not just about looking good. It's about getting those results. What are the types of balloons that are out there? We have fluid-filled balloons and air-filled balloons, as we heard about. We have double-filled balloons, adjustable balloons, uh, and endoscopically placed ones and swallowable balloons. So which balloons should we use? Should we choose the one that the patient tolerates? Should we choose the one that is effective in inducing weight loss? Should we choose the one that improves comorbidities? Or should we just choose the balloon that gives us less of a headache in the short run? So facts, air, as I said, is lighter than water. If you take the same volume of water and the same volume of air, air density is about 784 times less than water. So if you take one meter squared of water, it would only, uh, it would weigh a thousand kilograms and it would only weigh 1.2 kilograms of air. So why is that science important? Well, we all know, uh, as we've shown earlier, the Edward Guerin balloon and what, uh, what is not uh, achievable with balloons. In 1987, the Obesity Congress met with the ideal uh, balloons. They just decided that it should be spherical, smooth shaped and saline filled. This was a group consensus back in the 1980s. And since then over half a million balloons have been placed globally. So what is the data and how do balloons work? We all know the simple fact that balloons work by occupying the stomach, the majority of the stomach. So it's a space occupying lesion. So both air filled balloons do that and uh, fluid filled balloons do that. But they also cause uh, gastric delay. Um, and that's been shown in a study uh, where uh, Barham Abudai is the lead author here, where it delays gastric emptying. So you need a combination of both in order for the balloons to work efficiently. Now we've all talked about the various different types of balloons. Balloons. And you know that with the air-filled or gas-filled balloons, there are only two uh, available ones. 
So what's the data? Well, let's talk about the data in a randomized sham control trial, because that's the actual data that's out there, and then real world data. So in terms of FDA approved balloons, we have two uh, sham control trials, the, both where the uh, reshape and the obolon, which is the gas filled balloon. The data for this um, basically shows uh, with the reshape balloon that you have excess weight loss of 25% uh, compared to 11% in the sham group. And um, this is the data out here, which roughly translates to about 12% total body weight loss in the uh, intent to treat and completed analysis. Um, oh, sorry. And then the sham effect in the uh, Obalon balloon, we know uh, their balloon data um, for the gas filled balloons was only 6.8% versus about 3.5% in the uh, sham effect. So those are the sham effects. And so then we always say, let's look at the real word effect when you know what you're getting. So um, this is the Obera, which is a fluid filled balloon. You can see that the real word effect at nine months, once you have the balloon removed, you have 14% total body weight loss. Whereas with the Obalon, the real world effect, again, you have about 10% um, total body weight loss um, in the real world registry. So where patients know what they're getting, they don't feel the effect of the balloon, and that's the amount of weight loss they get. Um, uh, my opponent touched briefly on the side effects. Yes, the side effects are less, but so is the weight loss. So uh, what's the point in that? You could also get uh, medications, as we've pointed out earlier. Um, you have adjustable balloons. Upward adjustment also shows increased weight loss. Just just goes to add that the more uh, fluid in your in your body, the better the weight loss that you get with that. You do, you do get complications, and this is a, um, the uh, meta-analysis that shows the complications. But remember, patients need to remember that they have a balloon inside them. And those two weeks is very helpful to help them readjust their lifestyle, remember that they have a balloon, understand that they need to change their diet, uh, their habits, their exercise, and that they've paid for a product that will give them better weight loss. So I actually see um, the, the side effects of pain and nausea as an asset. The more you have it, the better the weight loss and the better the outcomes. What about improvement in comorbidities where there's only real data on fluid filled balloons? So here we show improvement in ALT, improvement in A1C as a surrogate for uh, in diabetes. And then even um, uh, an actual study paired biopsy, uh, liver biopsy with the fluid filled balloons and liver fibrosis scores showing that you do get regression uh, in A1C, but also regression in fibrosis um, as demonstrated on biopsies. So we have real life results. So what about direct comparisons? There have been two network meta-analysis, one that was published in 2018 and that one uh, by the AGA that's just been approved. Um, they looked at 22 randomized controlled trials and what they've shown is that the fluid-filled bal balloons have a 2.8% superiority over the air-filled or gas-filled balloons. Um, all uh, three fluid-filled bal balloons uh, were significantly better than SHAB, and with the gas filled balloons, one out of two was significantly better than sham. So what does that tell you? And finally, um, when all else fails, remember frozen. So this is the frozen two where air was trying to heat all the characters and water defeated the air. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Reem. I think you achieved a first. You brought Disney characters into a talk in a scientific forum and used it as almost a basis for scientific fact. Um, so you win the award there. Um, I do have a question though, Reem. Uh, we didn't really talk a whole lot as to the differences between water and air. air water is clearly heavier. And one would assume, and certainly we all have seen anecdotal cases where ulcerations happen, uh, obstructions happen because the balloon is going to always sit in the antrum. H how do you compare the benefit of 
liquid filled balloons and those types of uh, complications which will necessitate their removal um, when, uh, when trying to decide which is actually better in the long run. Ulcerations, bleeding, obstruction, which we see very little of in the air filled balloons aside from weight loss. So that's a very good question. Um, so as with everything, I would look at the risks and benefits, talk to the patient about what they want. We do give PPIs for the duration of the fluid filled balloon times, and that seems to decrease the risk. Although now when you look at the AGA review, um, the, the actual risk of ulceration is, is not as, as um, not as previously reported. We do, do get the worst cases when you see them, um, but I think being on PPIs, that would decrease that risk. And I mean, um, with air-filled balloons, you may get some pressure effects, but as, as you know, it's not gonna be as, as bad as with uh, fluid-filled balloons. Um, but I think then you'd want to look at the actual weight loss and what the patient wants to achieve. If they wanna achieve about 10% or less total body weight loss, and they don't wanna take any medications because we know that we can achieve that with medications, um, then an air-filled or gas-filled balloon is fine for them. But if they want a little bit more, um, then I would push uh, towards a fluid-filled balloon. Excellent. And, and Rizwan, you, you, I'm excellent. It is good to see you. Although I have to teach you, your fellowship isn't over yet. I have to teach you how to bring the tie up a little closer to your neck. Oh, yes. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's a good start. Um, you, you have a unique practice because it's very high volume. And as a result, the resources of the facility, the endoscopy suite, the, uh, the ability, every time you put in 90 balloons in a month, you have to take out 90 in six months. And if you're utilizing the same resources, endoscopy, that can be quite a challenge. H how do you see air-filled balloons offsetting that? Because the swallowable ones also, some of them do not need to have endoscopy or even upper GI to facilitate their placement. So do you see that becoming something that overpowers the sailing field balloons just on the pure resources that a hospital needs to put into place? Well, you're right, Dr. Rabili. I agree with you. Of course, this the idea of having solvable balloons making life much easier, or at least to restrict the patient having twice anesthesia. I agree on that topic. Uh, but in our country, we have been here, uh, we don't have limitations of, of resources in this part of the world. We have theaters available. We have endoscopy suites available and basically I have my own endoscopy unit where I can utilize this facility for insertion and for removal. But yeah, if we talk about not giving or, or, or avoiding anesthesia on patients, but of course, O-Balloon takes the show. But uh, if we talk about weight loss, like Dr. Reem was saying, that we do these procedures to get weight loss. And when we compare the weight loss, uh, for some reason, uh, the, uh, the heliosphere has much more better weight loss when compared to, to O balloon. And most of the studies done in the past, and even my study that I've done now, we are almost approaching like 8% of total body weight loss, where the dream was saying we get about 10% of total body weight loss. So we are just lagging behind by, by a few steps, probably adding a medication over these balloons, which I haven't done in my studies on any of them. And I don't know if there are any case studies happening to add some uh, you know medications over it to supplement an extra body weight loss to avoid serious issues of serious adverse effects like ulcers and pancreatitis, bowel obstruction, and we see this presentation today. The operations, laparotomies, and ending up with heliostromies. And we had this in, in Qatar too. I'm sure you know about it. We had two, three cases with uh, with uh, with fluid filled balloons and O balloons with such kind of uh, obstructions, ending up with laparotomies and enterotomies. I, I have just one quick question to both of you. Uh, so do you think there's going to be the perfect balloon that is going to be the best for placement, retrieval, resources, and outcome? And I'll let you both answer, and then I'll sign off because my operating room's a little bit noisy. <laughs> let Dr. Reem uh, take the show. Ladies first. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I think that the ideal balloon, uh, I think, is a combination of all four debates. Uh, I really believe, 
I, I was part of the ellipse, so I like the swallowable aspect of it, but I do believe as, as an endoscopist that maybe there is a place in endoscopy uh, for that. So maybe something you place endoscopically, but it passes through the GI system. Um, I like the, uh, um, the upward adjustment of the SPATS balloon with air. It's, uh, it's definitely a concept I hadn't thought of before, and it's just been recently published. I think the combination of both might give you less of side effects, but better weight loss um, and then uh, and then adding medications it should be something that we shouldn't shy uh, uh, from but it will enhance the weight loss to make it maybe uh, a little bit better than whatever weight loss we can achieve uh, with a single agent alone uh, being a debate I would just uh, speak a bit against uh, the theory <laughs> <Okay. laughs> talking about uh, yeah unfortunately yeah, if you're talking about spats, we know that technically for patients, this is quite difficult to have frequent visits. And, you know, in this part of the world, we have a hard time for patients even to follow up with o balloons and balloons like heliosphere. So for me, it's, it's, it's too difficult to, to follow such patients or, or insist these patients to come regularly uh, for having an endoscopic procedure to inflate and to deflate. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge headache for us. With, uh, with, with frequent, you know, inflations and deflations. And if we uh, talk about ellipse, we all know, I have seen many patients where they even come two months later uh, after having the ellipse procedure saying, I, I, I'm not losing weight. And we really find that the patient even says that we have passed the balloon. So we, we, we don't have a control uh, on this kind of balloon. You know, I mean, if they say it's four months balloon, we have seen patients passing them in two months. We've seen these balloons passing in even three months. And they pay a hell of a lot of money to get these procedures. And we see these balloons are already gone out. So preferably, I would go for balloons, you know, with fixed insertion and fixed removal, like O balloons or even with heliosphere, where we, 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 we know when we inserted it and we know the date of removal. At least we know that these balloons will stay for six months and, and we get the balloons out safely. Wonderful. So I want to thank uh, Helmut Spilly, uh, Professor Reem, Professor Mohammed for this great, great debate. And uh, we are going to immediately pass it on to Manuel Galvao uh, so we can actually introduce the next debate. Thank you very much, Yael. And it's, uh, as usual, an honor and uh, joy to co-chair the session with you. And I wanted to tell you guys that uh, Mr. Harris Kawaja put a stellar group of faculty here and we're gonna debate about how to mitigate complications in intragastric balloon. And the dynamic that we're gonna put it here is that uh, I'm gonna go a first round uh, of uh, introducing and also asking some questions to our debaters so you can know them better. And then I go to the second round of a specific question to each one of them. And I'll start uh, with uh, Mr. Evangelus F. FTMO, I hope my pronunciation is right. So he's a consultant at Chelsea, Chelsea and Westminster Hospital of NIH, NIH, NHS, sorry for the Portuguese. Uh, Mr. Evangelos, uh, uh, tell us, and then gonna go everybody, how many intragastric balloons have you deal with? And uh, how much of your bariatric endoscopy uh, practice it represents. And then I, I go back to you later. Okay. In our practice, because you mentioned, Manuel, it is an NHS practice, we offer the intragastric balloon as a part of a multimodal approach to super obese patients. Usually we, we use the one or two balloons uh, for people who have a BMI over 60 or they have an unfavorable body habitus to go ahead to do primary surgery. And we will treat them with a six or a 12 month uh, duration with one or two balloons. And we have treated about 350, 400 of these big people. And we aim to do the definitive surgery at the removal of the balloon six weeks later. So we see an average about 30 kilogram weight loss in these people. And these people are over 150 kilograms uh, weight. So they're quite heavy. That's one part, and this is the only part really in our NHS practice that we use the intragastric balloons, and we have a series of about 350 of them as a part of multimodal assessment. The other 
smaller part where we're using intragastric balloon is if, if we have someone who is borderline fit for surgery and we want to see if we can improve their physical status a little bit further and we use an intragastric balloon as a, a period of assessment and see if they lose a little bit of weight, will they become a little bit fitter for an anesthetic to go ahead for a definitive surgery. And these are the strict indications we're using for the NHS practice. The private practice reflects what the other uh, presenters said, mostly BMIs around early 30s who have a short-term goal in terms of weight loss. Thank you very, thank you very much. So now I am introducing uh, Professor Christine Steer from Germany. So she's a professor of surgery. She's the head of the department, one of the bright minds we have in our field. And Christine, please, how many balloons have you implanted? How much it represents on your bariatric endoscopy practice? And then I'll get back to you for a specific question. Well, um, I'm doing balloon implantation since I would say 2005. In Germany at that time, the uh, BIP was the only available balloon. But um, when I changed to Frankfurt to uh, Rudi Weiner's department, of course, we used also all other, other balloons. And uh, the most indication for balloons was also in our department, the bridging to surgery in super, super obese patients. Um, but I can't, I can't tell you any number. I don't know. It, it, it was hundreds. I don't know. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Sonja, so let me introduce you to Sonja Schiapeta, a dear friend, a bright young surgeon that recently established her, her practice on her hometown in Naples, and she's doing, let me tell you, she's doing fantastic. Sonja, how many balloons have you handled with that? How much it represents your practice? And I get back to you with your specific question. So hello to everybody. I have uh, about 10 years of experience. So um, I worked with Rudi Weiner, um, my great teacher, Christine Stier, um, and we used Obera in Germany, mostly. Um, here, I'm here, I'm running this um, center of excellence now from March 2019. And um, there was an endoscopist who used um, air-filled uh, balloons, heliosphere. At the beginning, I was quite uh, yeah, perplexed, but um, I'm now have to, I now here have to delegate. I can't do endoscopic uh, balloon placement anymore. So I said, okay, go on. And I have to say, um, so I have both experience about 500 balloons in totally. And um, I cannot see clinically, I cannot see a great, a great difference between Obera and Heliosphere. Um, an important thing is here in Italy, the balloon placement is covered um, when you have uh, stage two obesity with comorbidities. Um, and um, I have an ethical problem now because I wanted to start at LIPS. There's the discussion about endoscopy, obviously, but um, maybe I'm not a good businesswoman, but for me, it's hard to sell ellipse for 3000 euros when I can do a covered heliosphere. Um, so I think also this is a problem um, or in my, <laughs> my uh, hospital, for me, it's a problem um, that we can discuss. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Sonja. And uh, now, uh, keeping in Italy and going to the city that we used to say that all roads lead to that. Let me introduce you this gentleman, uh, our pioneer, the living history of intragastric balloon, our dear friend that has happiness with my heart. I'm introduce Alfredo Jenko. Alfredo, tell us your numbers and how much it represents now to you, the balloons. Uh, your microphone is mute. Just have to unmute it. Uh, in general, inferior left quadrant. Perfect. Uh, yeah, Alfredo, you mute it again. It's just one click. 
You're getting there. Relax. Inferior left quadrant of your screen. Perfect. Now, okay. It's okay now. Okay. Thank you so much, Manuel. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, hello, everybody. And uh, first of all, let me see uh, to say thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, my experience with the tragastric balloon started uh, about 20, 20 years ago. I've been using uh, uh, more or less all the balloons. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Okay, okay. And uh, uh, I don't know exactly how, how many balloons have been placing, and probably six, seven thousand of intragastric balloon. And uh, uh, my experience in Italy is that we are changing now the indication of a balloon use, uh, using because um, we now uh, uh, we continue to place the balloon as a bridge to surgery, but uh, we um, have seen that uh, the best treatment for the balloon, the best indication is earlier uh, in terms of age and earlier in terms of weight, uh, because uh, if we place a balloon in patient with a uh, lower BMI or with uh, overweight, we can achieve good results in terms of uh, uh, morbid obesity prevention. So for this reason, we uh, have been uh, placing many, many balloons uh, in order to avoid, uh, in order to prevent uh, morbid obesity, and less in order to treat patients with uh, high, uh, uh, higher intragast, uh, higher BMI. And uh, we are achieving very good results because if you place a balloon when the patient has a BMI territory terry two, you can achieve very good results. Uh, when you place an intragastric balloon when the patient has 42 of BMI, what you can achieve is only 10%, uh, probably 10% of weight reduction, but uh, the patients regain immediately after balloon removal, removing. Now, last experience is, is using uh, balloon for one year that we have been using together with the uh, ketogenic diet using intragastric balloon plus ketogenic diet, we are achieving very good results uh, after one year of follow-up. This is now Thank you very our experience. Thank you very much, Alfredo. All is clever, all is sharp. And now I'm gonna, gonna back to uh, our common, of my countrymen, uh, Professor Gustavo Carvalho. Let me introduce him. He's a bright young surgeon and endoscopist. And if, for the ones who didn't know, he even get and invented a Brazilian balloon, have a huge experience, one of our pioneers. And Professor Gustavo Carvalho, very briefly, what is your experience with balloon and how much it represents to you? Well, at first I'd like to thank uh, Galvão and, and Harris I think if it's not their great friendship, I'll not be here. Uh, compared to these great stars I haven't seen here, uh, I'm, I'm just a small guy in Brazil. Accidentally, I, I had to invent a balloon because uh, we were not able to buy easily in Brazil in the, the year 1998 when we started the research. And our project ended in 2004. So it's all together around 22 years placing balloons a little less than a thousand. This year, because of the pandemic and not so many balloons, um, patients are getting very fat. I believe very soon, a lot of balloons will come back to uh, all our office because so many people, we see them before the pandemic and now they are really fat in their pictures, including me that gained three kilograms. So thank you and I believe uh, the others will help much more than me in this uh, webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Gustavo. And now we win this first round with uh, the last but not the least, uh, Professor Braham Abudaye. And uh, you know that your country get late to the game, but you gotta, you guys are getting up to speed. So Braham, how many, what is your experience with balloons so we can get uh, around and specifically on the top, please? 
Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, by the way, <laughs> Professor Baham Abudaye, this, uh, this is a second. Professor Braham Abudaye, let me introduce you properly and I forget because we are friends and that's not an excuse. So Professor Abraham Abudaye is uh, the leading chief of the whole uh, uh, advanced endoscopy in the, in the Mayu system. And also very recently, he is now a professor uh, of gastroenterology. Please, thank Abraham, you, go thank ahead. You. Th thank, thank you, Galva. Thank you, my dear friend. Uh, so uh, it's, it's an honor to be with, uh, with pioneers in this field. My experience with balloons comes mostly from clinical trials. I either led or participated in the majority of the pivotal United States trials that investigated the balloon. Uh, so I have good experience, uh, I would say in the hundreds, not in the thousands uh, with balloons, but actually in a rigorous uh, academic fashion. So uh, uh, therefore I think the, the key here is to keep this uh, field honest and academic because we have a temporary device that could have complications and the question is how do you weigh the risks and benefits with these with these devices. Thank you very much, Braham. And the intention of Harry's, of Ariel and, and myself when this first round of questions is not to extend that, but to get you guys to understand what is the reality, different reality in different countries, different uh, practice in balloons before we talk with complication. Uh, any device have complications. Balloons, uh, before we start, is a very, very safe procedure. But we have to be, as Abraham State, have to be honest and, and discuss about all the complications. And I'll get back to Mr. Evangelos. And uh, I read uh, with lots of interest, uh, Mr. Evangelos, your paper, uh, with your series that you published on this Orbera balloon. And uh, it came to my attention, your, your good results and all of the strategy that you disclosed to us in bridging and super bees and a very clever one. But uh, it cracked my attention that you got two patients with perforations that eventually die. And that should be, it could be a very traumatic experience to you, to your team. And so how you get over that and what is your tips to us here in IBC to mitigate this terrible complication. Please. Uh, thank you very much. When I presented the series in New Orleans in the SMBS in 2016, I remember one of the American surgeons stood up and he said, that's unacceptable, you had deaths. And I said, you have recently approved the balloon yourself, so wait and see what's gonna happen. And then I think it was June later on with the FDA put an alert about deaths related to the resale balloon that had already been approved in, in USA. Bottom line is that if you use a balloon, uh, you subject the patient to a complication. The two uh, stomach perforations we had were relatively earlier in the series uh, where the patients were allowed to go to a solid diet very soon after the insertion of the balloon. And people trying to eat in a relatively uh, or more or less obstructed stomach, and they ended up uh, vomiting and bursting the stomach. Uh, you know, eventually, two of them, they're very big guys, and they died from the complications of septic uh, shock uh, despite going to surgery. So we changed our practice and we became more aggressive with antiemetics. We became more aggressive with the spasmolytics. And for the first week, they're not allowed to consume any solid at all for the first week, it will be only an absolutely liquid diet. And since then, we did not have any uh, adverse effects in terms of stomach perforation. So my advice would be, if you're gonna put a balloon, keep the patient for the first week until it settles on lots of antiemetics and make sure they just don't consume any solids because putting solids in a stomach with a tight balloon, you're uh, inviting trouble. And this is our honest experience. And uh, it was traumatic for the unit uh, to occur, uh, but we felt obliged to, to present these results for, the people's, for people's awareness. Thank you, thank you very much. It's very enlightening and very helpful to all of us here. And I'll, I'll go and follow with uh, Christine. My dear Christine, uh, I'll take uh, advantage of your brilliant mind to ask you about two topics hyperinflation and pancreatitis. So we have this at least two awards for the Americans from the FDA saying, you know what? People with balloon, they have hyperinflation. People of balloon, they have pancreatitis. 
And everybody was like shocked uh, with this one. Uh, but can you really uh, get to us and state what is the real deal with those complications in balloons, please? Yeah, both complications are, are widely described in papers, uh, as we all know. Um, and I think uh, what is really true is uh, pancreatitis develops really with the weight of a balloon. I, I only saw cases of pancreatitis, uh, whether in reality or in papers, um, with balloons that were uh, liquid filled. Uh, and I think it's, it's the pressure it's, uh, of the balloon itself on the pancreas. And those liquid filled balloons always are placed in the antrum, so directly in front of, uh, of the pancreas. And if there is a lot, of, um, a lot of motility, a lot of pressure on this, it may happen. Um, hyperinflation, I have to tell, I have never experienced myself, but this is of course a pity and um, takes a lot, of, a lot of space then intragastrical. So um, as you know, it's an emergency, you have to uh, remove the balloon then. Um, I think it's, it's a problem with the valve of the balloon, the hyperinflation. Um, but um, as I said, I can't, I, I have no experience with that myself in my own practice. Thank you. And as you, as you as I understand from your words, that they don't, they don't play that much of a trouble for the balloon press, is that correct? No, they didn't, they didn't uh, play that much trouble um, as that much um, uh, use in our, in our department, no. Thank you very much. And uh, m now I go with Sonja. Sonja, so that's my question to you. That's gonna help a lot of people here in, in IBC. And, and the idea here is how we mitigate uh, complications. The first thing is to set it up. So how you get back to your hometown, how you set up your unity in terms of uh, how you implant the balloon and how we remove the balloon in terms of anesthesia, the amount of resource needed. So uh, please help our young uh, participants here in IBC. Okay, so... Um... I think the first important thing is um, everybody has to know the contraindications for a balloon. Um, don't put a balloon when a patient takes anticoagulants. Don't put a balloon in large hiatal hernia. Um, don't put a balloon in, in previous gastric surgery. So I think this in my new setting, I'm coming here, I put up a, a new center. Um, is an important thing that everybody has to know. Then PPI for six months, another important thing. Um, I have to say in Germany, um, we did positioning of balloon always with um, propofol and um, midazolam. Here, um, propofol isn't seen uh, we don't get it so easily. We have to take it from the, the OR. And, uh, but um, I think the most important thing is, and as a bariatric surgeon, we know it, we have to check up the patient. We have to see if it's a patient on OSAS because everybody of us know the typical patient who comes in and you know, during the uh, uh, procedure, he will desaturate. So um, you have to know what are the risks of a obese patient. Um, you have to take attention um, to aspiration. Um, and um, sometimes uh, they are really wild uh, and maybe you need uh, some more hands uh, to help you. So it's important um, yeah, to have a good sedation and to do a quick procedure. So you have to know what you do. Thank you, thank you very much, Sonja. And uh, my dear friend Alfredo, I uh, get a very special question to you. We have to take advantage uh, from your experience. So what I wanted to ask to you is uh, strategies on balloon removal that we learn and you teach me so much uh, during this time, how to safely remove the balloon. And also what are the strategies with the balloons that kind of migrate, especially that I know that you have experience in publish about the, the Lipsy balloon, uh, the swallowable balloon. What are the strategies 
to a safe removal and also when the balloons migrate, what you should be doing. So this is going to be help a lot of the ones who are listening and seeing us. Again, your uh, your mic uh, is mute now. It's good. good. Okay. Go ahead. Now, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. In order to 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 perform a, a safe uh, a removal procedure, uh, procedure is very important to prepare the patient for uh, uh, the procedure. This means to prepare the patient with proper diet uh, before the removal. So we start this before. They can eat only liquid or semi-liquid diet. The same diet that we give them after the balloon placement. First, during these five days, they don't eat fibers. And then it's very, very important a, a, a work with a good team, a good anesthesiologist that know the, the timing of the procedure with the good instruments for uh, to, to puncture the balloon, the removal grasp of the balloon, and uh, uh, working a good step. This is uh, uh, what we can do. Uh, this is the best for uh, a very safe removal, removal procedure. Removing uh, that is different in the, the uh, balloon wall is more or less the same, but ellipse, uh, removing ellipse is, uh, um, uh, is a, a, a short procedure of just five, four, five or six minutes. Removing uh, or bare balloon, we need at least 12 or 13 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alfredo. And uh, I'll go and move to Carol. Anna Carolina Hoff, a very good question. So spontaneous balloon deflation, meaning balloons malfunction and things like that. Can you give us uh, your experience, what you think about that is one of the complications that we, it's, it's very like uh, not nice to have it. Please go ahead. We are having a problem nowadays in Brazil. You are very aware of that. Regarding spots three, there's a this this serial number that is giving us the the headaches because they they are giving us the, the early deflations, and we are seeing it during the the insertions or during treatment. And right now we we, we just saw in our group another one being. Uh, we have to change the balloon because of that. It's not a common thing. It was on this particular serial number, but it it has these complications because the, the, the timing of the procedure is longer. So if you have a, a, a valve uh, defect during the procedure, you have to remove the balloon and insert a new one during this procedure. So as uh, Dr. Sonia said, uh, if the patient is not very well sedated, you're going to have a wild horse and you have to perform a double insertion and a, a withdrawal. So it's kind of hard for us. You have to have a good anesthesiologist or another uh, doctor in the, inside the room so he can handle the, 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 the sedation part so you can focus on solving the problem. And uh, regarding... Uh, our deflations, we have methylene blue. So you have to explain to the patient that he cannot use anything inside the water of the, of the I don't remember how to use the, the toilet. Toilet. The toilet. The toilet. And uh, so it, it doesn't, <laughs> the color doesn't mix and turns blue and you're not seeing the deflation before because you have a gap time of 40, 24 to 48 hours you can give medications and be, put the patient on a liquid diet so you can replace this balloon with safety and go on with the treatment. Thank you very much, Carol. And again, uh, Gustavo, uh, good question for you. And I know that you have experience on that and you have worked with that. So uh, 
fungal contamination is something that we uh, tend to forget, but it's really one of the complications of balloon that I know that you have some strategies how to deal with that. So can you clarify that for us? Yeah, and that's quite common, especially if you are in a tropical country when fungi is uh, part of the stomach of the, the people who are around here. Uh, it's funny that uh, some of my friends in Portugal have never seen uh, a balloon full of fungi, but for us it was so common that we started to giving some anti-fungi drugs every month for the patient, and it's oral, it's non-absorbable. Uh, you can select any kind of the ones you want. Uh, for us, fluconazole was the easier one to give, but something that we will wash out the balloon from the fungi, and it will make it your balloon much easier to remove if you are having so much fungi in your balloons. It's very common in my town, Recife, and maybe not so common in, in south part of Brazil, like Sao Paulo and Rio, because people have different habits and the different types of food. But that is my tip for the fungi, Amigo. Anything Thank you else? very much, Gustavo. And, and brilliant. And uh, Abraham, you're back, sir. So you state that most of your experience with balloons is on the trials, and but trial gives you a, a, a very nice uh, opportunity. And I know that you have studied a lot about it. So how we should, what we should do to mitigate the balloon intolerance to make sure that the patient pass to the adaptation period of this first week. So can you please enlighten us with your research? Yeah. Thank you, Manuel. That's a very important point. So we showed from level one evidence, which is randomized controlled trial, that the balloon delays gastric emptying, fluid-filled balloons delays gastric emptying significantly. And if you take 100 individuals and measure their gastric emptying at baseline, they're not all the same. That, that, that means there are people who are going to be slow emptiers at baseline. They're going to be Are you guys listening to Abraham? Abraham, we lost your sound. No. I don't know if you hear me. Abraham? Uh, we lost your sound. Maybe the winter has arrived uh, at Rochester again because uh, summer is not unlikely. So let's see if we can uh, fix that. If not, uh, I'm going to briefly pass that to Ariel uh, and to Tom. They are collecting the questions uh, coming from our chat. And if you have the opportunity just to watch what the amount of questions and how you guys become so popular, more than 3.5K, 3.5 thousand of people are watching us live. And I'll get back to uh, our president, Tom Rogula, and to Ariel uh, as soon as uh, Abraham uh, has fixed his trouble. Uh, before, I, before I do that, Abraham, can you talk to us? Uh, we cannot hear you as well. So uh, unfortunately, I have to pass the bar on uh, to Ariel and, uh, and to Tom and to uh, Abraham can connect again. Ariel, Tom. Go ahead. Are you, your You're mic is mute. Better. Cool. Now it's okay. There we go. Okay, wonderful. So, Barham, try to disconnect from the talk and, and reconnect. Maybe we can get your audio. It was a great, great uh, question uh, being answered. Uh, Tom, uh, can we have uh, some uh, closing remarks? Yeah, that was that was absolutely amazing uh, talk. I was listening to every every uh, every expert with, with open mouth. Um, I mean, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's an evolution. Uh, the the balloons are here and will stay with us for a very long time. I'm pretty sure. Uh, for most of us, uh, bariatric surgery is an excellent additional tool. I use it very frequently for very high risk patients as the as the bridging tool. I'm continuing using this, and uh, today's meeting 
opened my, my eyes to such great, uh, great different options that we, we currently have. So I'm really grateful to all the speakers for preparing excellent talks. Thank you, Tom Manuel. Let's try Barham one more time. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, yes. sir. Please go ahead. All right. So the question was, the question was, how do you select the patient to enhance safety and tolerability of the balloon? And we did investigate this uh, in in the multiple trials that we conducted, and basically, the fluid-filled gastric balloon do delay gastric emptying significantly. Sometimes the gastric emptying is delayed by more than double or triple the baseline readings. So, and if if you take the baseline gastric emptying for an individual, not everybody's the same. So if you took 100 people and measure their gastric emptying at baseline, you're going to find 25% of the cohort have rapid emptying at baseline, 25% will have slow emptying at baseline, and then everything in between. So if you took this 25% who already have delayed gastric emptying at baseline and gave them a balloon that now going to double or triple their, their gastric emptying, they're going to go to a state of gastric atony. And that's where all these problems happen. They start vomiting a lot and, 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 and the stomach uh, perforates. So the question is, could we use baseline physiology? And now we have a breath test that could detect in an office setting, where are you in the spectrum of gastric emptying? and pick our choice of a balloon, whether air-filled or fluid-filled based on, on, on that concept, I think we're gonna go a long way to enhance safety and efficacy. Most of the problems of the balloon is not a problem of endoscopy, it's the problem of a foreign body in the stomach, and that's the key message here. So thank you very much, uh, Raham, and I think this uh, ends this part of the debate, and I'll pass the bar to uh, Tom and Ariel to our closing, very final closing remarks. I wanted to thank you all for your patience, uh, our participants in the debate. Thank you heartfully. So for such a wonderful uh, debate and a questions that I can assure our audience, they were honest. They come from their heart and their experience. And that is what IBC is to all of us. We have free space to debate and to think the, the, the truths of our hearts and mind. Thank you very much. Ariel and uh, Tom. And this is all the time we have today. I wanna to thank again our chair and moderators, as well as our expert panel, our partners and sponsors, but most importantly, all our friends and colleagues watching online. For past events, as well as for a schedule of upcoming events, visit us at ibcclub.org or on any of our social media platforms. Don't forget to mark your calendars as the third International Bariatric Club Oxford University World Congress is taking place the 23rd to the 25th of September of 2021. Now, please join us for another episode of Spotlight on Industry and today's sponsor, ConMed, featuring their timely smoke evacuation and insufflation technology. Hello, my name is Gary Teagan. I'm the Senior Director for Clinical Affairs at ConMed's Advanced Surgical Division. So ConMed Corporation has been dedicated to smoke evacuation for some time, first with uh, its own line of smoke evacuation products for open surgery and laparoscopic surgery, uh, second with the acquisition of SurgiQuest, which brought to a market uh, really best-in-class laparoscopic options for insufflation and smoke evacuation with the air seal system. ConMed purchased a company called Buffalo Filter, which was regarded as the leader in uh, smoke management. The AirSeal IFS, or Intelligent Flow System, works with three different modes of operation. The first mode is AirSeal mode, and that basically provides a constant pneumoperitoneum and continuous smoke evacuation. Uh, it also incorporates the use of the AirSeal access port, which is a valveless trocar. Uh, there's a group of super users, which we've given instructions to, uh, that enables them to use it in such a way that it minimizes the potential for gas venting out the top of the port. Uh, any gas that does go back to the IFS is filtered down to 0 0.01 microns using our proprietary filter. And that was validated independently by an outside organization. Um, the IFS also has a second mode called smoke evacuation mode. And this is our closed loop solution. By closed loop, I mean it. Uh, there's an insufflation line and a smoke evacuation line. Uh, 
It can be used with two conventional trocars, standard trocars, as long as they have uh, lure lock connectors or stop cocks. And this basically provides a continuous loop of insufflation and smoke evacuation. When a gas returns to the IFS, it is filtered through the same filter media, which filters down to 0.01 microns. The third mode that the IFS has is something called standard insufflation mode. And this basically functions like any other conventional insufflator. Uh, it provides carbon dioxide and then senses every few seconds to make sure that the pressure is appropriate. But we often recommend the use, uh, certainly in the COVID area, of an ancillary smoke evacuation system, something like the Plume Port Active, uh, which is made by Buffalo Filter, recently acquired by ConMed Corporation. And this product uh, connects to the canister on the ground and also contains a 0.1 micron filter. So Gary, tell us about what the whole system is comprised of. So you basically need the IFS, uh, and then your choice of three different tube sets. Again, the ASM EVAC for air seal mode, this SEM EVAC for smoke evacuation mode, and what we call the SIM tub or standard, standard insufflation tubing. People buy the air seal system to use it in air seal mode. Uh, the COVID area has actually opened up another opportunity for us uh, with our second mode, uh, which is smoke evacuation mode. And that incorporates uh, a tube set that has two lines that split one goes to, um, they both go to the stopcocks of individual uh, trocars, conventional trocars. And one is an insufflation line and the other is a, is a smoke evacuation line. Can I understand then that also the micro droplets produced by the ultrasonic uh, devices, will those also be uh, removed? That's a great question. So in both air seal mode and smoke evacuation mode, uh, the air seal IFS is drawing gas from the cavity back to the box for filtration. And that basically, um, it filters any gas that comes back, whether it be uh, 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 smoke from electric cautery or some type of plume someone from an ultrasonic device uh, can be drawn back to the IFS for filtration. Uh, and then either um, departure out the back of the box in smoke evacuation mode or recirculation back to the, uh, the air seal access port if you're using it in air seal mode. How does one find the devices or contact the company for more information? So uh, ConMed is an international organization. Uh, we have primarily direct representation in most countries. We have distributor representation in some countries. Uh, you can certainly email me at garyteagan at conmed.com and I will forward uh, the contact information for the person requesting uh, information on our products. So this is Spotlight on Industry, Smoke Evacuation and Insufflation. We wanna thank Gary Teagan from ConMed Corporation for joining us today. Thank you for having me.